Welcome everyone to NSTA Web Seminars where you find live interactive learning at your desktop. My name is Flavio Mendez and I'm the Assistant Executive Director at NSTA for the NSTA Learning Center. And today's program is titled The Science of Modern Agriculture, Pest Management, Insects, Friends or Foes. Uh, this program is presented by Valerie Bays, Eric Van Fleet, Anil Gauda, and Wasim Akbar. We're going to go ahead now and uh, turn over the microphone to uh, Valerie Bays, who will be, begin with the introduction. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in this evening. Um, this is the second part of a five-part series where we talk about the science of modern agriculture. Um, in our first session, we talked about the science of GMOs. Um, in this session, we'll be talking all about insects and entomology. In the next section, we'll be talking all about crop protection and the chemistry used in agriculture. Um, for the January session, we'll be talking about engineering and all the, the cool mechanical um, innovations in agriculture, like sensors and drones and data science. And for the February session, um, we have that to be determined based on the types of questions or interests that we get throughout the, the other four, which leads us up to the March um, National Conference. And we have a question for everybody. Will you be attending the National Conference? We will, and we'll have a booth there and three breakout sessions. Uh, we encourage you to stop by, ask us any questions you may have, and we'll also have teacher resources there. Thank you, Valerie, uh, for setting that up. Uh, let me just remind our participants, the poll voting button is uh, right underneath their name. Right now you'll see uh, the little square box that has a check mark on it. Uh, and so you can click on that and select your answer. Yes for the green check mark, no for the red X. Back to you, Valerie. Great, thank you. We'll give it a couple more seconds to get a couple more votes in, and then we'll see how many people will be at the national conference. Can we go ahead and display the results now? Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and log the responses and display the results on the screen. And uh, let me uh, I'll make that a little bit bigger so we can uh, read a little better. Here we go. So we have uh, uh, four people who will be attending the conference. They've made the commitment. Ten people who have uh, decided not to attend. And we have another ten people who did not answer. Maybe, maybe considering attending, maybe still thinking about it. Back to you, Valerie. Great, thank you. Okay, so when I think about the science of modern agriculture, I see a lot of really great ties to the next generation science standards and how the sophistication of agriculture nicely aligns with a lot of the topics that, that are listed here. If you all could use the tools on the sidebar to kind of vote where you think some of um, these areas uh, have a cross-section the most, um, I'd love to see where these marks end up on, on this matrix. So I just gave you the uh, clip art tool, and uh, you can use the clip art uh, to mark uh, as Valerie instructed. Remember, the clip art is at the, the very last button on the uh, toolbar, and use the common symbols tab, please.
Great. We'll give it two more seconds, and then we'll move to the next slide. Well, thank you, everybody, for participating. I know that me and the rest of the entomologists here would definitely agree with you. Weather and climate plays a huge part in agriculture, human sustainability, earth systems, um, natural selection and evolution, all of these uh, places that you've placed marks, we definitely would agree with. And we think that, you know, agriculture is a, is a great uh, platform to, to talk about science through. Okay, so we have an action-packed agenda today. Um, we're going to do introductions, uh, then we'll get into the meat of the presentation, um, and we'll talk about helpful resources. We're actually going to talk about helpful resources first. Um, I unfortunately have a commitment at 6 o'clock Central Standard Time that I have to be at, so I will be leaving the chat. However, the entomologist will continue on with the presentation. And lastly, we'll open it up to panels and Q&A. In our first session, we had a lot of questions, a lot of great discussion, um, and a lot of content to cover. And we didn't get to all the questions, but we did have one person who followed up on that STEM education, that outreach at Montano, um, uh, email, and we were able to get an answer for that person. So we definitely encourage you to email that inbox if we don't get to your question. Okay, so hello, my name is Valerie Bays, um, born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri. I went to the University of Missouri Columbia and majored in biological science. Um, I thought that I wanted to go to dental school. Um, it really wasn't until my last semester of undergrad that I realized I was not as passionate about oral health as I once thought. So what would I be doing with this degree in biology? Uh, shortly thereafter, I started working for a data science company where I was basically the middle conduit between um, the pharmaceutical company and the uh, uh, companies that, that were doing the clinical trials and then analyzing that data. And for me, that work was interesting, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't as fulfilling as I wanted it to be. And so oftentimes when I go out to career fairs or interact with students, I'll tell them that knowing what you don't want to do is just as valuable as knowing what you do like to do. Um, so that led me to a conversation with a friend who was working for this company called Monsanto. I didn't even know how to pronounce it at the time, to be honest with you. Um, and it's sort of strange, if you go to Mizzou uh, and major in biology or chemistry, you're in the College of Arts and Science, but if you major in biochemistry, you're in the College of Agriculture. So I actually didn't even know that agriculture was this thing and how interesting and cool um, agriculture was. So I interviewed for the position and um, started working, well, sorry, I should back up. Um, I was working at a school at the time and finishing up my master's in education. And so I interviewed for this position for the uh, education outreach coordinator for Monsanto. And I was, uh, they chose me for the job. So I think because I had the science background and the education background, it was a good fit. And that was in 2012. Um, shortly after taking the role, um, Monsanto really took a step back to reevaluate, you know, how they were talking about their their innovations, and really what uh, what the conversation was was that, you know, Monsanto did a good job of talking to the people that we sell things to, farmers, um, and we're a publicly traded company, so we talk to our shareholders. But we did not do a very good job of talking to consumers, people who are curious about where their food comes from and how it's produced. So really, in um, 2013, Monsanto made a very special effort to go out and start doing these outreach engagements. And so for my role, I've been going to conferences, hosting podcasts, um, getting really smart people like the entomologist you'll be speaking to and hearing from today to go out and, um, you know, kind of do ask us anything for them so that we could really help to dispel some of the misinformation that, that's out there. Um, so we hope that this forum is no different and you ask any um, questions that you have. Anil, go ahead. Good evening, everyone. I'm very glad to be here to share what I know about insects and ag. My background, I grew up in a farming family in India. Actually, I was required to work in the farm before and after school. 
that gave me an opportunity to see the bad sides of the insects. At the same time, we also were rearing silkworms at home, and the money we earned by doing this activity paid for my education. So as, as a boy growing up, I got to see both good side and bad sides of insects. And that's where I developed passion for entomology and agriculture. So that helped me get into a bachelor's degree in ag and eventually a master's degree in entomology. Uh, I, I got both of those degrees from India. After that, I had an opportunity to work at Monsanto Bangalore. That's when I first heard about Monsanto. And my one year work, they really uh, inspired me as to um, how to, I um, mean, how do we develop technology that helps farmers around the world to manage uh, their problems, especially in, safe, in a sustainable and safe way. So with, with an advanced degree, I may be able to play a better role is what I thought. And then I came to U.S., went to Auburn University in Alabama, worked on, on the insects uh, developing resistance to Bt proteins or Bt crops. Then um, immediately after graduating from there in 2008, I joined Monsanto. And it's been nine years here. I have always been a project lead, leading uh, one or the other to develop insect control products. And currently, I lead a team of scientists that work on early discovery and development of insect control products. Over to you, Asim. Hi, Wasim. Go ahead and uh, click the talk button so we can hear you speak. Go ahead. Okay, great. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Wasim Akbar. Uh, I'm a native of Pakistan. Uh, in my high school, I had the dream of becoming a medical doctor and serving the humanity. Uh, but fortunately or unfortunately, I missed medical school by a small margin, and I ended up in an agricultural university. Uh, after two years of general agricultural studies, uh, when the time came to choose a major subject, uh, I opted for entomology. Uh, and there was a good reason for that. Uh, I wanted to serve humanity by saving crops from the devastation that insects can cause. And after listening to today's talk, uh, I hope you will agree with what I am saying about devastation by insects and entomologists serving humanity. Uh, my dream to receive a world-class education uh, brought me to Kansas State University in 2001, uh, where I received uh, a MS in entomology. Uh, later, I joined uh, Louisiana State University Entomology Department in Baton Rouge. Uh, where uh, my research focused on uh, developing um, various insect management strategies for sugarcane growers. Uh, I received my PhD at LSU and uh, I joined Monsanto in 2010. And since then, I have been involved in early phase development of transgenic traits for managing corn and uh, cotton insects. Um, that's all I have. And uh, uh, to, to you, Eric. All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Eric Van Fleet. Uh, I grew up in uh, central Pennsylvania. Uh, my mom was a biochemist, and she really inspired me to get my uh, bachelor's degree in biochemistry at Ithaca College, where I graduated in 2009. While I was there, I studied the uh, P. aphid, as I mentioned earlier in the chat. I was studying how they determine uh, which plants they prefer to feed on. Uh, and during that process, I was involved in the aphid genome project. So I got to do a lot of really cool genetic work. Uh, eventually, I landed up in the uh, entomology program of Cornell University to get my master's degree. Um, I was still working with aphids, studying their immune system this time around. Um, and after I graduated, I came out to St. Louis, to Monsanto, where I worked in our regulatory division uh, for a few months before I got my current position 
uh, studying stink bugs and how we can develop new insecticidal products for controlling them and protecting the crops that they damage. Great, thanks everybody. Okay, so just a quick highlight. We wanted to um, highlight this new documentary that's out called Food Evolution. Food Evolution was funded by the Institute of Food Technologists, and the director um, is an independent director named Scott Kennedy. Um, I really encourage you all to check this out. It's available on Hulu and YouTube and other platforms. I think that it does a really great job of not only showing agriculture from a you know, a national United States perspective, but also a global perspective. Um, I also know that uh, uh, the Institute of Food Technologists has partnered with an organization called USFRA, which stands for United States Farmers and Ranchers Alliance, and they plan to create um, education-focused lesson plans that go along with the documentary. So feel free to check that out and um, show it to your students. We have um, a bunch of resources that we put together in this matrix. I won't go through every single one of them since we have uh, a lot to cover today, but I broke it out by podcast, teacher professional development, and so on and so forth. Um, I encourage you to go back and Google these different organizations. They're doing really, really great work. Master teachers putting together this, um, this content. Um, I think podcasts are wonderful because you can be driving to work and listening to them and, and learning something on the way. Um, you know, really great teacher professional development, uh, uh, like BioBuilder, which talks all about synthetic biology, um, and even groups like the Ag Education Discussion Lab on Facebook. Um, it is a, a, a private discussion lab, but if you elect to, to add yourself, um, most certain that they will add you. Um, and they're just sharing really great content as far as, you know, hey, how do you prep for this type of lab, or um, have you considered this sort of lesson? And everything is very open source. It's really cool to see people sharing great things. Um, we also wanted to highlight um, a recent partnership with um, Ag in the Classroom. If you go to agclassroomstore.com, you can check out um, a kit. This kit uh, was a result of a lot of people asking us, hey, can we grow um, conventional seeds and transgenic seeds in our classroom because our students just want to, you know, phenotypically see if there's a difference between the two seeds or we want to run, you know, PCR on these seeds. Um, so we wanted to make sure that these seeds were available. So if you go to that, that site right there, you can get access to those as well as um, lesson plans that are aligned to the next generation science standards um, and, and ready, readily available on their curriculum matrix. Okay, so the science of agriculture. Now, we wanted to set this up with kind of what is the shape of the problem. Now, those of us maybe who didn't come from an agricultural background, maybe when we look at this, we don't innately see the challenges that are at hand. But when a farmer looks out in their field and sees these things, or when an agronomist or an entomologist looks out, they can see soil compaction, they can see drought, they can see insect pressure, fungal pressure, and other pathogens and high weed pressure. These are all things that, um, that farmers have to be aware of and make observations of and then make decisions. They have to decide what types of technologies or practices will they implement to mitigate some of the risks that the environment poses. And as many of you probably know, we have over 7 billion people on the planet today. And by 2050, we'll have over 9 billion. That's a lot of people. So how will we uh, feed, provide food, fuel, and fiber for these 2 billion extra people if our arable land is declining, um, the climate is changing? You know, we're, we will have to use our resources really smart. We'll have to leverage technology so that we can be as efficient as possible, and also considering the fact that diets are changing. So as some countries, you know, move up in the uh, socioeconomic ladder, they are demanding meat. And in order to meet that demand, those animals will need to be fed grain. So a lot of different challenges at hand, and these are some things to consider. 
But it's not all doom and gloom. If we get really smart people together working diligently and sharing best practices, we can develop solutions. So we have some pictures of herbicide tolerant crops there. We have, um, a, you know, technology like drones and sensors that can do imaging technology and scout the crops. Um, we even have really cool platforms um, that can make recommendations for nitrogen application. You know, where to apply nitrogen on a field, how much and when, what are the soil types, what are the moisture levels, um, and even just, you know, really great agronomic practices like cover crops there in the corner. So Eric is going to tell you about the basics of insects because that's important before we get into um, the meat of it. All right, everyone. Today I'm going to talk about some of the uh, basics of insect biology, uh, particularly how the diversity of insects has allowed them to fit in throughout the ecosystem and what entomologists do to understand and interact with them. So uh, most of you will be familiar with what defines an insect. They're invertebrates lacking a bone structure in favor of a hard exoskeleton. The uh, Exoskeleton is made of chitin, which is a substance made of long chains of modified sugars bound together with proteins. And how these proteins and sugar chains are arranged allows for structures as diverse as hard defensive shells and thin flexible wings. Insects have a segmented body consisting of a head. Oh, let me bring up my pointer here. Uh, a head consists, which has the uh, mouth as well as the sensing organs. The uh, abdomen, where the legs and, if relevant, the wings will connect and host most of the musculature of the insects, as well as a thorax containing most of the vital organs. Uh, insects also have six legs. Even immature insects like maggots or caterpillars, which appear to have different numbers of legs or no legs at all, will have six legs as an adult. Because of these characteristics, arthropods, like millipedes and spiders, even though they're closely related to insects and share some traits with them, are not insects. Crustaceans like crabs and lobsters also share traits like chitinous shells, but they're more distantly related. And while some entomologists do study these creatures, we're going to focus today on the true insects as they're the most relevant to the work that we do here at Monsanto. So now that we know a little bit more about insects, let's discuss why they're so important. Insects are some of the most common life forms on Earth. There's over a million described species of insects, and by biomass, they make up about 95% of all animal life. Insects have a ton of biodiversity. There are over 30 distinct orders of insects and countless families and subfamilies, ranging from nearly microscopic leaping springtails that live in the forest leaf litter to gargantuan horned beetles. They can fit into nearly any ecological niche from decomposer to pollinator and from parasite to predator. And to demonstrate this diversity, I'm going to talk about some categories of insects that interact with humans and are helpful and harmful in various ways. And hopefully along the way, I'll give you some examples that you might be able to use in your classrooms. So first, let's start off talking about some of the beneficial insects. One group that most people will be familiar with is pollinators, who transfer pollen between flowering plants to aid the plants in their reproduction. The honeybee is a well-known pollinator, but they're not the only ones. There are plenty of diverse native bee species who specialize in pollinating different plants, like this brightly colored sweat bee, uh, who frequently pollinates uh, wildflowers and orchids. There are also species of moths, beetles, and even flies that are also pollinators, each with their own specializations. While the honeybee is a great generalist, there is a symphony of pollinators that keep ecosystems diverse and flourishing. Uh, while pollinators mostly survive off nectar, there are bugs which are predators or parasites, and some of these can have a positive impact as well. If insects like aphids get too numerous and are threatening our crops or our gardens, they're likely to get chomped on by a lady beetle. They may also have to face off against something like the spined soldier bug, uh, which uses its needle-like mouth parts to suck out their vital fluids. Finally, they're at risk of being hunted by parasitoid wasps, which don't eat their targets but will inject 
eggs inside of them, letting the baby wasps grow up and killing the pest in question in the process. Finally, there are some insects which are used directly by humans for our own benefit. The most famous of these is the silkworm, which was identified and cultivated in China over 5,000 years ago. Silkworms have been so domesticated by humans that they've lost their ability to fly, and they've expanded from their native China to all over the world because humans brought them along. Insects that we find useful have a tendency to follow us around. Honeybees are another example of a species which was introduced to the Americas from Europe because of their value in pollination and honey production. Another example of a useful insect is the cochineal scale, an insect native to Central America that feeds on cactus and forms a waxy protective coating that you can see around the bugs here. Um, these bugs contain a compound called carmine, which for hundreds of years was used as a dye because of its brilliant red color. Carmine is even extracted from these bugs and used to the present day. If you like ruby red grapefruit juice, it might have gotten its color from this bug. Unfortunately, there are also some bugs which are harmful to humans in a variety of ways. Some of the most notorious are insects which transmit disease, such as the blood-sucking bug, which transmits Chagas disease throughout Latin America, and mosquitoes, which transmit a number of different diseases worldwide. There are also bugs that cause medical conditions themselves, such as bed bugs, which can bite, causing rashes and allergies, and head lice, which can cause extensive itching. So I know mosquitoes are a really big topic, and while we don't do much mosquito control work at Monsanto, there are a lot of entomologists who work to prevent mosquitoes from spreading throughout communities and transmitting diseases. The first line of defense against mosquitoes is physical and mechanical. Pest control specialists will often patrol neighborhoods, monitoring areas where water might pool up, giving mosquitoes a chance to breed, and present, preventing that pooling if possible. The most effective way to prevent insects from getting to humans is also physical, in the form of bug netting. For major infestations, though, chemical sprays are often used. There are common bug repellents for individual use, plus things like DEET, but there are also larvicides, which can be used to in areas like rain gutters and sanitary sewers to kill immature mosquitoes. And finally, the last line of defense is blanket spraying an area with pesticides used to kill adults, although often this has an ecological impact. Because of the limitations of chemical treatments, new techniques are being developed based on genetics with techniques such as sterile male release that dilute the population of reproductively viable bugs and even genetically modified insects, which transmit a gene that is lethal to the mosquito's progeny, allow us to lower the insect population in a way that is durable. Some of the insects that we're most interested in at Monsanto, and which you'll hear about throughout this talk, are pests which cause agricultural damage. These insects reduce the amount of food produced by crops by either damaging the plant, like the western corn rootworm feeding on corn roots and stunting the growth of the corn plants, making produce unappealing or unusable, like stink bugs, which can cause discoloration and promote fungal growth in seeds, or in the case of some pests, just by eating the crops before we have a chance to. And finally, there are pests which just get in the way of our day-to-day -day life. Cockroaches spread filth around, making for an unclean environment. Termites can cause severe structural damage and require expensive treatments and repairs to get under control. And even a bug that is normally innocuous, like a box elder bug, can become a nuisance. Normally, bugs like this box elder bug will hide in leaf litter or under tree bark to survive the winter. But many an unfortunate homeowner has had to deal with them taking a shortcut and residing in their nice warm garage. So what do entomologists do? Faced with the massive diversity of insects and the myriad ways that they interact with people, entomologists do the best they can to manage the insects that are harmful, protect and cultivate the insects which are valuable to humans and the environment, and develop new technologies to make these interactions more efficient. And you may or may not be aware, but entomologists impact you in many ways in your day-to-day -day life. Pest management specialists are trained in getting unwanted bugs out of your home, 
but medical entomologists also help identify sources and reduce populations of disease-causing pests. And this can be anywhere from your local sewer system to remote military bases. Insects are a critical monitoring tool that conservation agents use to assess the health of our forests. And they're often tasked with protecting those forests from invasive pests. Some entomologists even specialize in discovering new techniques and control agents for invasive species that threaten to throw our ecosystem out of balance. And of course, many entomologists are tasked with protecting our food supply from pests and doing it in a way that uses a diverse tool set to reduce pesticide use and protect beneficial bugs. And by the way, this graphic was provided by the Entomological Society of America, which has a lot of great resources on their website on insect bases, basics, um, careers in entomology, and other hot topics in the entomology world. Uh, so moving on to a quick question and answer segment, uh, do you as educators talk about the roles within entomology uh, sorry, talk about uh, roles within entomology and potential job opportunities with your students. And I believe Flavia is going to enable the clip art tool for this one. Oh, no, it's a polling tool. Thank you very much, Eric. I appreciate it. Uh, yes, as we practiced before, you can use your poll voting button, which is uh, uh, right underneath your name on the participants window. You see the letter uh, lowercase a, and as a drop down menu, you can select uh, a, B, or C as your answer. Do you talk about the roles within entomology with your students? Eric, I really enjoyed the presentation so far. Uh, we uh, uh, haven't seen comments from uh, participants, but we do encourage them to uh, participate in chat, especially if they have activities, lessons, units, resources that they're using in their classrooms on this topic do take an opportunity to share with others. I'm going to go ahead now and uh, close the uh, poll. And uh, let me uh, go ahead here and here and lock. And now we'll display the responses uh, on the screen for everyone to see. Let me uh, expand the, uh, the view here. So we see uh, seven, uh, seven individuals answer yes. They are uh, talking about entomology with students. Two of them said no. Uh, we have nine people that are considering it, and nine individuals who did not respond to the question directly. They may have responded via the chat window. I'll turn it over back to you, Eric. Thank you very much. Um, so I wanted to take a quick pause to open up the uh, open up for questions from the audience. Uh, so if you have any questions, go ahead and type them in chat. Um, I and the other moderators will do our best to answer them. Uh, we're going to try to limit this section to two questions just so we don't run too long on time. Thank you, Eric. Um, I see a question uh, and it has to do with uh, resources for teachers, specifically resources for elementary uh, students. I, I see uh, also sort of combined with that, uh, again, interest about uh, activities involving forensic entomology. Eric, are you aware uh, of any such resources? Also, I'd like to, Eric, invite other members of the audience, uh, educators who may be aware of resources as well, to share on the chat with links or, or comments. But let me turn it over to you, Eric. Thank you very much. Um, so I did mention the Entomological Society of America. Uh, and they have resources for all ages. Um, in fact, I think they have a lot about specific careers in entomology, including uh, forensic and medical entomology. Um, I don't have a lot of those details, but if you uh, visit their website, which I'll go ahead and link in the chat after this section, um, you'll hopefully find something that will be useful to you in your classroom. Thank you, Eric. Let me invite participants to consider the content you've covered, the basics of insects, different types, uh, those who are more helpful, those who are more harm harmful. On that, on that context that was covered, uh, do you have questions for uh, Eric, whose expertise is in this area? Please take a moment and type your question on the chat.
Okay, well, we don't have to force it if there are no questions. If if you have, or you think about questions uh, throughout the program that maybe um, uh, you want to uh, ask Eric or any of the other uh, panelists, uh, do go ahead and type it on the chat. I see that uh, Anil uh, added some information about a website. Uh, he says here's where you can find more information. Uh, and, and it ends on the word kits.html, so it might be relevant to uh, educators. And I see that Eric also uh, shared uh, shared information about the Entomological Society of America. I see uh, Lena, uh, Nutrients for Life and Agriculture, or Ag, in the classroom. Uh, she has given them high marks, really good for elementary grades. Thanks, Lena, for sharing. Uh, so let's go ahead, Eric. I'm going to move the next to the next slide, uh, and I believe we're going to passing we're going to be passing the microphone now to uh, Wasim Akbar. He'll be talking about uh, healthy ecosystems essential for agriculture. And uh, Eric will be jumping on the chat window uh, and uh, assisting with questions as they come on the chat. Uh, and again, this is informal. We all know something on this topic, so make sure that what you know you can share with others. Uh, Dr. Akbar, the microphone is yours. Thanks, Flavio, and thanks, Eric, and uh, thanks, everybody, once again, for being here today. Uh, it is a really real pleasure to have the opportunity to talk to you all. Uh, Eric covered some basics on entomology, and by now, uh, you should have a pretty good understanding of this fact that there are good as well as bad insects. Uh, in the remaining part of today's session, we will cover two more things. Uh, I will cover how good insects are playing their role in promoting a healthy ecosystem, uh, what challenges some of these important insects are facing, and what we all can do to help these insects. Uh, then Anil will come and cover some of the bad insects that pose challenges to farmers and what entomologists are doing to help farmers manage those insects sustainably uh, on their farm. So this is to re-emphasize uh, what Valerie already mentioned, that we have enormous challenges ahead of us, uh, increase in population, changing eating habits, climate change related effects, and decrease in available water are all bringing agriculture and farming communities at the forefront of these uh, challenges. We believe that healthy ecosystems help agriculture thrive and thus help farmers increase their yields on their farms and which can uh, result in lower commodity prices. So we as consumers can all benefit from that increase in production. So ag ecosystems have a lot of biodiversity and the fact is that there are more beneficial insects out there than the ones what we call pests. So it is extremely important for us to ensure that the ag ecosystems maintain that scenario. So how we can ensure that? Uh, that's a common question we address in scientific circles and we have a strategy for that. One way is to protect the species that are in danger due to farming and non-farming practices. Uh, we also need to preserve habitats where some of these ecologically important species like to flourish. And another thing is the preservation of existing plant varieties and development of newer ones to provide a broader base of genetic diversity of these species. Among the insects, in my opinion, we owe the most to honeybees they are considered to be the most important pollinators out there and all our major crops, fruits and vegetables depend on such pollinators. 
approximately one in three bites of the food that we eat every day is owed to honeybee pollination. And honeybee pollinate worth $20 billion of crops in the U.S. and over $100 billion globally. So all the joys we have with juices, fruits, and nuts in our daily meals, we owe those to pollinators such as honeybees. And you can imagine what a boring breakfast we will have if the honeybees were not able to do their job properly. So most of you might have heard the term colony collapse disorder uh, and the honeybee uh, decreasing populations of honeybees. And entomologists who have been studying honeybees agree that there are a multiple uh, set of factors uh, that are driving these declines. And like any other biological organisms, these um, also have some pests and diseases around them uh, that can affect their population. And I'm showing some of those over here. And varroa mite is one of the parasites, external parasites, that is uh, blamed for uh, many, many uh, high population decreases in the hives. Uh, but other than that, poor nutrition also makes colonies less resilient. And so when we have more areas under specific agricultural cropping systems and cities keep expanding with sprawling road networks, shopping malls, and residential neighborhoods, all of these things lead to less number of diverse nectar resources for honeybees. Also, when there is more land under agriculture, then incidental pesticide exposures could also be contributing to the problem. Honeybees are also transported across the country by beekeepers for pollinating various crops. And the seed and environmental conditions during that transportation are also likely to be contributing to the problem. The scientific community is well aware of these challenges and working hard to protect honeybees. Honeybee Health Coalition exists that brings together beekeepers, researchers, government agencies, agribusinesses, growers, conservation groups, manufacturers, and consumer brands, and other key partners to improve the health of honeybees in general and specifically around production agriculture. Monsanto is an active member of this coalition because we firmly believe that a healthy habitat is vital for biodiversity and biodiversity is important for sustainable farming. Monarch butterfly is another important pollinator species in ag ecosystems like honeybees. Uh, they are very, very important pollinator for various crops. And interestingly, monarchs are also very unique insects in terms of their life cycle. There are usually four generations in a year. Uh, the first three generations complete their life cycle within a couple of months, but it is the fourth generation that lives up to six months and makes monarchs famous for their amazing migration. This amazing migration starts in fall when temperature starts going down in Canada and generation number four of monarchs starts flying southward. They end up in these regions shown here in, um, in California and Florida, but majority of these monarchs go down here uh, in Mexico and spend the winter over there. Some of you might have seen the scenes like this, where tens of thousands of monarchs are hanging with tree branches and sometimes even bringing them down with their weight. So the green arrows that I'm showing here on this map, these are the ones which indicate the, uh, their backward migration path when they start going back to Canada during spring and 
uh, in that time period. And some of these butterflies are interestingly, they, they travel up to 2,500 miles from Canada to Western Mexico. Uh, but, but I'm throwing that number, but the question is, is that really true? Uh, so there is an interesting story behind that. And I thought this would be a good thing to share with you all as to how sometimes involvement of citizen scientists can help uncover big mysteries in nature. So the discovery was made by Fred and Nora, who I'm showing here in this picture. They made this big discovery in 1975. Uh, both of them worked at University of Toronto and both had a passion for monarchs. Even as a young boy, Fred would ask himself, where do these butterflies go in the fall? And he spent many years finding answer to this question until he came up with a unique idea. He developed a technique to tag butterflies by sticking price stickers on monarch wings and put his address and phone number on them. He and his wife, they put ads in journals as well as newspapers and they roped in a group of citizen scientists from across the continent to help them in putting tags on tens of thousands of monarchs and then release them. And then several months later, he received a call from Mexico where a citizen scientist had found monarchs with that tag. And this is how it was discovered that monarchs can fly 2,500 miles one way and this big mystery was solved. But here is the dilemma. The dilemma is that monarchs exclusively feed on milkweeds. And if there are no milkweeds, they don't lay their eggs. On the other hand, farmers don't want to see any weeds on their farms uh, because they compete with nutrients uh, and, 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 and their crops. So they want to get rid of all the weeds on their farms. So like in the case of, and there is a concern on declining monarch populations and like, but, but as I mentioned in the case of honeybees, there are several factors contributing to this decline in monarch populations. Uh, pine trees in Mexico are being cut illegally in large numbers, uh, depriving monarchs of their winter habitat. Uh, the inclement weather events such as hurricanes also affect monarch habitats, uh, pathogens and predators also keep a check on their population and change in land use and practices in the migration path of monarchs are all contributing to this issue. And again, going back to our belief in importance of biodiversity and our vision for sustainable agriculture, we are committed to restoring habitats for monarch butterflies we are partnered with numerous private sector, governmental, non-governmental agencies, as well as academic institutions to specifically address this element of biodiversity. At our Monsanto sites, we have designated areas in 72 of our facilities that serve as habitat for monarchs. We are also involved in various outreach activities to educate public on how we can all help monarchs mitigate the effects of those challenges that I just mentioned. One popular thing is uh, backyard gardens uh, with milkweed through drone uh, to attract the pollinators. And I think this could also be a good science project for you guys to consider in your classrooms. Uh, and with that, I believe I have, yeah, we have a Great for a question. Thank you, Wasim. This is Flavio Mendes. I'd be happy to uh, help facilitate the questions. Uh, just as we did before with the segment from Eric, Eric talked about uh, insects, etc. cetera. Uh, Wasim focused uh, on habitats, ecosystems, and honeybees and monarchs. If you have questions for Wasim, please type them on the chat. Uh, Eric is also in the chat window responding as questions come as well, if there are questions. 
So uh, let me go silent here and let, give you some think time. Well, Seema, I don't see any questions. Let me try one. Uh, have we reached a tipping point in the population of, say, honeybees and or, and or monarchs where we need to be concerned about uh, them disappearing and going extinct? Uh, no, I, I don't think we have <laughs> we have that much uh, of a problem. Uh, I believe that a lot of effort is already going on for the last several years and. We are seeing the uh, fruits of that efforts, and uh, there there are good news. Um, both monarch as well as many bee populations are coming back. Uh, although we have not solved all the issues, uh, but again, uh, a lot of uh, effort on several fronts are uh, ongoing. So I don't think there is any concern of those important species going extinct. So. And I see uh, Anil uh, added a comment there in the chat window saying that uh, Monsanto is also developing products for honeybee health. So again, uh, uh, opening, giving one more chance for, for questions before we move on to the next segment, uh, which will be led by uh, Anil Gauda. I see Eric has posted a, a, a comment on the chat window, and uh, uh, I see there's a link there as well uh, if you want to plan uh, monarch-based activities for classroom. Uh, Eric recommends a, an online uh, a website that maybe you want to go to and take a look at. Thank you, Eric. So we'll see, but I see no questions at this time. Let me ask you to please turn off your mic, and then uh, we'll move on with the next segment of the presentation, so the uh, microphone button, just click on the talk button on your computer, was seen to okay, turn it sure. off. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And uh, we'll now turn it over to Anil uh, Gaura, who will be talking about uh, entomologist's role in helping farmers with evolving challenges. Anil? Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm back in a year. Um, thanks, Wasim and Eric. You guys set up it nicely. Um, now I'm going to spend a few minutes talking to you about why are we worried about insects, especially from our perspective. Uh, if, if you look at these pictures, these are cells exfoliated, for example. Um, here um, on, on the falarin worm, how it is damaging the corn plant, and the one next to that one, corn ear worm, feeding on, on the corn ear and damaging, not only eating away some of those kernels, but also making an entry hole for some of the fungus or other bacterial uh, or pathogens to enter the ear and, and damage the ear further. Then on the right, the bottom right, you see a soybean looper feeding on the soybean leaf and completely chewing up that black leaf there. And one above that one shows the cotton bowl one feeding on the cotton. So I don't think I need to explain further as to why it is important that we control these insects. Right. So, but this, I mean, what we do at Monsanto is develop technology solutions that are sustainable and safe for farmers to use in their farming operations to control the insects. We also have other platforms where we provide solutions to farmers, but that is not the focus of today's talk. So if you look at this picture, I don't have to tell you how devastating insects can be. Um, two slides ago, I told you about the soybean looper feeding on soybean plants. And here, in a couple of rows, you can see how, how well they damage these plants. There is no standing leaf material left on there, and so where you can think about harvesting some soybean, plant, uh, soybeans 
or for for production or for eating here. So indeed, the the insect damage can be very bad, especially if you look at the crop loss and the food loss. If you don't control the insect, our soybean production can be less by 25 percent, and the corn production can be less by 50 percent. Cotton up to 80 percent loss can happen just because of the insect feeding right there. So as entomologists, it is our job to study and develop tools for farmers that they can employ on their farms on a sustainable basis. Here we recommend using integrated pest management tactics to manage insects. These tactics include a combination of practices such as cultural control, biological control, host plant resistance, and lastly, chemical control. These options are necessary as one or more of these may or may not work on a given insect basis. Here, cultural control uh, relies on adjusting the planting time uh, to when insects are not present in the field, so you can, you can drive, grow the crop and, and get it out of the uh, window of opportunity where insects are more, most damaging. Or it can also be um, uh, thinking about doing things like uh, destroying the crop residue from the previous season. So you can kill as many insects as you can which are overwintering on those crop residues so there will be fewer insects in the following generations. Similarly, post plant resistance relies on plant innate ability to withstand insect feeding. So you heard from our colleague a uh, few weeks ago in the first part of the series regarding the breeding operations of uh, processes. We do consider uh, breeding varieties of the hybrids that have natural resistance to pest tolerance in the field. That could be one of the ways. Also, um, in this picture right here, you see my colleague Osim who was just talking about uh, what we do about insects. He is, is padded up here and then covered up on from top to bottom to try to spray insecticides in the on part of the sugarcane plants, try to control uh, aphids and white flies, other sucking insects in this ecosystem. So we resort to this as a last option because when, when you spray these in, uh, insecticides, which are not highly specific many times, then they not only kill your pest insects but also beneficial insects uh, such as predators and, and parasites in the environment. In fact, that I means if, if you are careful in how you use those you could use biological control agents effectively in controlling these insects. In addition to all of this, plant biotechnology presents another tool to mitigate key uh, challenges on the farm. In, in the first session of this series, my colleagues uh, talk, covered some information on how we do breeding and genetically engineered crop lines. As you learned, we, specific, we insert a very unique protein in a plant genome that makes it resistant to insect feeding and thus farmer will not have to spray chemically, uh, chemicals on its farm to protect its crop. So in fact these two pictures were taken from our field trials where you can see the corn plants being chewed up on, by the palarmi worm in one side and then again the repeat of the soybean field trial I was showing earlier. So in the real world, with high insect pressure, these insects can devour your plant completely. So entomologists play a key role in, in the discovery and development of uh, insect control products that are transgenic nature or other chemicals or biological control agents to effectively manage these, these uh, incidences. Here, are, here is the slide that shows the, the various stages of development of the transgenic plants uh, technologies. Um, and I will go to the next slide and, and then explain where exactly we play a role. All, I mean, Vasim and I and uh, Eric, we all play a role in the early part of the discovery and development of insect control products. So in these stages, we spend um, we, we evaluate more than thousands of different insect control proteins, or it could be Bt proteins, or any other bacterial protein, 
and we test them in a three step process. One, evaluate them in the artificial environment and show that something works on insects. As a step two, we test them in the plant, which, which predominantly speaks to the phase one activity and show that it works. Then eventually we show that it works in the field environment and we have sufficient data to believe that this can be a useful product for farmers. That's when we hand it off to our colleagues in phase three and four so that they can generate the data necessary to uh, get the regulatory approvals across various countries and then eventually bring it to the market to farmer science. So it is also worthwhile to point out that this whole process takes anywhere between 10 to 15 years and after spending anywhere between 100 to 150 million dollars. While uh, I have a slide at the end uh, talking about the safety, well, say, typically the safety data are generated within the safe phase three here when, when we submit it to the government for approval. In our hands, we study the safety of our products from beginning on the way to the end. The most important fact I want to make here is it would be a bad day if Monsanto or any company brings out a product that is not safe for the environment or safe for the consumers. Especially after, after spending so many years in the research and development and after spending so much money, you do want to make sure that, that you bring out the best product. And obviously you have to make sure that the product is going to be efficacious in the market. So the next slide I'm going to point out here, it is not a one, um, one discipline work. We, we rely heavily on people coming from various backgrounds or various expertise. Um, when, when we go through this product discovery and development stage, like the product concepts or gene discovery evaluation, we rely on people like microbiologists, molecular biologists, biochemists, producing some of these proteins for testing, and obviously entomologists set up a lot of experiments to evaluate them and, and, and show the results where it makes sense to advance a product from step A to step B. And eventually we will have the people working uh, from backgrounds on ecology or the toxicology to understand this product is safe in the environment. And eventually we bring it to the market with, with marketing specialists and data scientists and business executives. Bottom line, what I want to say in this slide is it takes multiple um, efforts of multiple people from multiple expertise. It absolutely ties back to, to the STEM education that you all are leading with your kids in your classroom. And I, I tried to uh, provide an overview of this slide earlier, just to pictorially to represent here. This is the step one where we, where we put the insecticidal protein into the assay plate and then we infest with insects and we show that the, whether the assay material we tested there, whether it's active or not. And then later on we go to the implanter testing, we bring a, a small leaf section and put it in insects to test and if it works then we advance the product. And eventually we do controlled environment tests and then finally to the field trials to show that the product works as expected. And one last way to wrap up the session here, as I mentioned in earlier somewhere in the presentation, that we generate data um, that, that is that's used by many regulators around the world to approve our technologies. Um, regulatory agencies in each country must approve a potential product before it can be sold to farmers or imported for food and or animal feed in their country. In the U.S., for example, the USDA, EPA, and the FDA share responsibility for overseeing and approving GM crops based on their specific areas of scientific expertise. For example, USDA will evaluate whether it is safe to cultivate a new trait meaning whether it's safe to use the plant in, in their farm and grow so that they don't have to worry about whether this plant is going to spread everywhere in that country. And EPA will, will evaluate whether it is safe for the environment. What, what they mean here is the animals that, that encounter these plants in the, in the field. It could be a cow or it could be a bird or other insects that come in contact with these um, plants whether it is safe for them, obviously except excluding the insects that you want to control. And finally, FDA 
will will uh, look at whether it is safe to eat the product um, that come out of uh, that GMO approach or the biotech approach. Um, so here it can be voluntary. What I mean here is um, sometimes companies develop technologies for insect control or other uh, beneficial traits, and some based on the technology how it works. It may or may not affect human health or any animal health either. So depending on the need, the FDA will get involved to say, I want to see this data before I approve it. Or they might say, I don't see any concern here, so you are free to go. So they make the call as to whether they want to look at the data or not. So I believe the last, the last slide. Yes, and now we'll open it up for questions to me or any other presenters before me. Well, thank you, Anil, uh, and I'll be happy to moderate uh, the, the questions. Uh, questions for Anil, please. I'll turn off my mic here to give you some time to think about questions you'd like to write. Also, feel free to share information about resources or links that can help in the teaching of this science and, and these topics. I'm fascinated, Anil, by the uh, collaboration between individuals who have different expertise. I like that slide that had all those different careers that are involved in the work that you do. Uh, that's very exciting for teachers, I think, because students have different interests. And uh, uh, so, so uh, that collaboration is crucial. But let me open the floor for questions. Okay, well, I, I don't see questions on, uh, on, on the chat, uh, in the chat area. What I'd like to do then is, uh, with your permission, Anil, I'll, I'll go ahead and move on to the next segment, uh, which is uh, uh, sources and more information. It looks like uh, we're turning the microphone back briefly uh, to Eric. Uh, and, uh, and I think after this one slide, then we uh, will open the floor for uh, uh, questions for all the uh, all of you together. So, Eric. Yes, thank you. Um, so uh, here, uh, I know we presented a lot of resources up front, but here's another few links that should help you if you want to talk more about some of the topics that we've covered during this presentation. Uh, we have a lot of information on uh, mosquito control. Uh, we have the link to the Entomological Society of America uh, and Entomology Today, which I believe we linked both of those earlier in the chat. Uh, and there's a great video as well here on the uh, monarch butterfly migration that you can share in your classroom. And hopefully uh, you can find these resources and more um, useful to you. And um, that's, I think that's about all I had. Okay, thank you, Eric. I'll go ahead and move uh, the slide forward. And here are uh, uh, our three presenters uh, for today. We also remember had Valerie Days participate early in the program. Um, so we wanted to give participants an opportunity to ask questions based on uh, the information shared today. Uh, it is now 7.40, so we can have a uh, uh, a good five, seven minutes of, of Q&A here. And then after that, we can proceed with the survey for the conclusion of the program. In addition to questions, you may also share comments, uh, impressions about the presentation, maybe some areas uh, or aha moments for you, uh, and uh, uh, maybe also some ideas on how to share information like this with our students. So let me uh, turn off my mic. Don Boonstra, also feel free if you'd like to uh, share question, comment, reactions. Uh, just please type those in the chat. See that we have a, one person typing on the chat window. So 
So uh, while we wait for some more questions to come in, I just kind of wanted to speak to Anil's point that it takes uh, specialists with all sorts of skills and experience to really contribute to what we do here at Monsanto. Obviously, we're all entomologists. We know a lot about bugs, but we have uh, biochemists and geneticists uh, who help us understand the proteins that we're putting in our products. We have agricultural specialists who uh, help not only to put those genes into plants, but to grow, the, grow and support those plants and let us do field trials. We have experts in uh, plant diseases and fungal pathogens. Uh, we have a lot of folks who do really specialized research who um, you know, understand the environmental impacts and do the risk assessments for our product to make sure they're absolutely safe. And uh, all of that comes together with expertise of uh, sales associates, uh, people who maintain our databases. So in modern agriculture, there's a role for a lot of different science-minded individuals to really contribute to doing something great. Thank you, Eric. I see others uh, on the chat. Uh, Rashmi share uh, in a half moment there uh, about uh, the modern butterflies and uh, what was shared today in the presentation. Dr. Schaefer is up, uh, seem to have enjoyed the presentation. Other comments from our participants who, again, will uh, don't want to push it, but you know, we'll leave the uh, floor for open for another two or three minutes. And if um, there are no questions, then we'll move on for with the closing comments from NSTA. I see Janine and Rachel are typing on the chat. Okay, thank you, Rachel and Janine, for your comments uh, about the presentation, and uh, glad that you found it useful for your middle school classroom. Uh, gentlemen, uh, I'll go ahead uh, then, uh, and uh, I'll proceed, if it's okay with you, proceed with the next set of slides. We'd like to thank um, our, our presenters uh, this, uh, for, for, for this uh, program, Valerie Bays, Wasim Akbar. Eric Van Fleet and Anil Gauda. And uh, we like to also thank our sponsor for the seminar, uh, Monsanto. Uh, and uh, finally, I uh, would like to thank the uh, management team at NSTA and the web seminar team for their support of NSTA web seminars. This uh, slide concludes our program. And uh, stay here. In a moment, we will share with you uh, the uh, link to the archive, to the sorry, to the survey. I should have said to the survey, so you can complete it. But also, uh, we uh, uh, say good night as well to those of you participating in the program as an archive. Have a pleasant day, and we'll uh, shutting down the program at this time.